Our guest today is a congresswoman of Illinois' 17th Congressional District. She is now in her third term and is the first woman elected to Congress from her district. Our guest today, there we go, you can clap, go ahead. Our guest today is now in her thir third term and the first woman elected to Congress from her district. Our guest today's district includes the Quad Cities, Peoria, and Rockford. She is a graduate of Springfield High School. There we go, there we go, thank you. That's all right. She earned her bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Maryland and her master's degree in journalism from the University of Illinois at Springfield. She and her husband, Jerry, are the proud parents of three grown sons and two grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, Congresswoman Sherry Bustos. Sherry? All right. Hello, Chicago. How's everybody doing? Um, Jay, thank you very much for that introduction. Ed, thank you. Uh, LaRue and I know each other from, uh, they've got a nice presence. UPS has a nice presence in my congressional district in Rockford. And Mush, thank you very much for all of your hard work in getting this put together. It's, it really is an honor to be here. And um, I appreciate the invitation. And hello, Chicago. Um, so I, you know, I know that uh, when, when you're in Chicago, um, you know, it's kind of the center of the universe for the, for the state of Illinois, right? And it's, it's the center of the universe probably for most people here. But um, as you know, Illinois has 102 counties, and only one is Cook. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so there, there's also so much more to our economy uh, than just what comes out of the high rises all around us. Um, and uh, quiz. Anybody know what the, okay, some of you can't answer this because I know you know this answer, but uh, I'll just tell you. The number one economic driver for the state of Illinois is agriculture. It's agriculture. So um, it, a lot of people don't know that, but we've got 72,000 farms on 27 million acres. And that's an important thing to know because not only do those farms and the farmers help drive our economic engine in the state of Illinois, but so does agribusiness. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about why that's important to me. Um, and so as I stand up here, I want to give you a little geographic perspective of my congressional district and being a downstater, and also a little bit about who I am personally. So uh, I think the vast majority of the people in this room I don't know. Um, so I'll, I'll fill you in a little bit about who I am. Um, I am the only Democrat in the Illinois congressional delegation outside of Chicagoland. So if, if you think of the, the map of Illinois, you've got all, all of the Chicagoland area tucked away in the, the northeast corner here, but all of the rest of it, um, it's all Republicans in Congress except for, except for me. I'm also one of 12 Democrats in the entire nation that won in a district that Donald Trump won. Okay, so, uh, and uh, so we've got a, a, a leadership table that we sit around in Washington, D.C., where, where we make decisions uh, for the Democratic Caucus in the U.S. House of Representatives. And everybody sitting around that table comes from somewhere other than the Midwest except for me. So um, I think I bring a little bit of a different perspective. And, and why that matters, I want to get into that a little bit. But it's not just because of agriculture. Um, I am on the Ag Committee. Um, I'm also on the Transportation Committee, which I think are great committees to represent our congressional district. But it matters because of who we are as Midwesterners. Um, so a little bit about my personal background. I, as I said, I'm a downstater. I grew up in Springfield, as uh, Jay pointed out. Uh, but I spent a lot of my summer days on my grandfather's hog farm. And this is uh, my cousin Colleen and, and Brittany probably recognize this picture. But this is, a, this is a view of my grandfather's farm. It's in a town called Milford, Illinois. Anybody ever go to Milford? The, the metropolis that it is. I saw Rich S. Colca <laughs> raise his hand. A place where there are more people than, or more pigs than people. 
Um, and but but they were just absolutely wonderful memories. Um, so that's what I would spend some of my summer days doing, going to my grandfather's farm in Milford, Illinois. Uh, my father was a newspaper reporter before he went on to work in government. And uh, he ended up working for two governors, a lieutenant governor, a state treasurer, a secretary of state, and a US senator. So around our kitchen table, and there are people in this room, especially at that table right back there, you guys know this very well, but around our kitchen table, we had some of the best public servants, I think, in the history of the state of Illinois, minus Abe Lincoln. Um, but um, so that's the lieutenant governor down there at the bottom. Anybody recognize that guy down there? Uh, so that was, the, that was the lieutenant governor that my dad worked for, a guy named Paul Simon, and who actually lived with us in our house for a half a year. That's a whole other story. We can get into that later. That's my dad on the far left. Did anybody recognize the guy on the far right? So that is, that is Senator Durbin, uh, just uh, not too long out of law school. So, so it would be people like that that would sit around our table and talk politics late into the night. And even as a little girl, they let me sit right next to them. And I cannot think of one time that I was ever shushed or told to go away, that it was an adult conversation. I could sit there as long as I wanted to. And I, I really just had one price of admission, and that was I would have to go to the refrigerator and grab my, grab my dad a Budweiser. And as, and as long as I kept doing that, um, everything was fine. So um, fast forward, I, I went to school. We already uh, talked a little bit about my, where I went to school. But um, when I graduated, I moved up to the Quad Cities. And uh, does anybody know how many qu cities are in the Quad Cities? <laughs> That's a trick question, but there are five. <laughs> We're a little unusual, seriously. Though. So we have Moline, Rock Island, East Moline, and then on the Iowa side of the river, we have Davenport and Bettendorf. So there really are five. And um, so I, I started there um, as a newspaper reporter. Uh, I covered the, the night cop beat. That means I, I covered crime. And I would go on to cover City Hall. I would go on to be an investigative reporter. This was a billboard that they had when they were promoting investigative reporting. I was an editor at one time. Um, but in that first beat that I had, I, I, my hours were 5 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. And um, so I got to know a lot of the, the, the third shift cops. Um, and, and so one day I got invited to this third shift party. So that means at 8 a.m. they get off work <laughs> and they have a party. And I showed up two hours into that, so you can kind of imagine the, <laughs> the environment. So um, I met a guy there. Um, I was a rookie cop reporter, and he was a rookie cop. And it was a guy named Jerry Bustos who ended up being my husband. Um, that is us at our wedding. I know, a few years ago. So that, 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 <laughs> that, that is, uh, that's 30 uh, plus years ago. Um, we have since had three sons. And um, um, you know, just it, it, it all reminds me as I was putting this together just what a great place we, we live. Um, one other fact about this third shift party, it was at a bar called the Lil Cowbell, not Little, Little was not spelled out, Lil Cowbell, um, where they actually have seat belts on the bar stools. So, so that, that, that really was, <laughs> that was our, our beginning. Um, but it's, it, it's a very blue collar working uh, class area and it, uh, it, and it really is what I love so much about it. Um, but we've also got some of the best farmland anywhere in the world in this congressional district. And when I have people who come down and visit, they remark at just how beautiful it is to drive through the farmland and, and see all the crops, the corn, the beans, and all of that. Um, so just down the street from where I live right now, is a, a little company called John Deere. And uh, we, we, we are the world headquarters for John Deere. Combines are literally made right down the street from where I live. Um, we, also have, uh, we also have Caterpillar in my congressional district, um, it, the birthplace of Caterpillar, you know, the, obviously the big yellow iconic earth moving equipment that was founded in my congressional district as well. So in addition to ag, we have a great manufacturing history. And, um, you know, it, it's also, it tells a story about the kind of people that come from our area because um, it is John Deere and places like Caterpillar that have given so many people 
so many opportunities. My father-in-law was literally born in a boxcar. So if you can picture that, he was born in a boxcar. That was his home when he was first born. And he didn't go past the eighth grade. He had an eighth grade education, served in World War II. But because of John Deere and because of the United Auto Workers, he was able to support his four kids and his wife and truly live the American dream. And I'm very proud of that. But that was then. That was then. Here's what downstate Illinois looks like now. And the challenges we face that I think, while it's downstate, it's something that we should all be interested in, whether you're in Chicago or any place in our state, I think we should care about this. Sensata. Um, when I first was running for Congress, it was 2011, and a story that was dominant in our region was about this plant called Sensata. Um, they make, uh, they made, that's a little bit of the end of this story, but they made automotive sensors. And they had been in the town of Freeport, Illinois for decades. And what happened was Bain Capital ended, ended up buying Sensata in a leveraged buyout. And what was not in Bain Capital's equation was to keep those jobs in the little town of Freeport, Illinois. And that had devastating effects. They didn't care that uh, this was the heart and soul of this community, that Sensata did better alongside the community doing better. And the community really um, reacted to this. And, um, and it was a hard hit. It was something that I spent a lot of time with the workers who were about ready to lose their jobs. Um, w one of whom is a woman named Dot Turner. I got to be friends with her. I got to be friends with a lot of people. And Dot Turner started working at Sensata when she was 18 years old, fresh out of high school. And she's 61 years old in that picture when she was losing her job. So she had worked there for 43 years. And, you know, she wasn't lucky enough, like maybe some of us will or have been, where there was any kind of retirement party for her. There was no gold watch, the old proverbial gold watch. Um, nothing like that. Rather, she spent her last days on the job at Sensata training her replacement worker who came from China and who would go on to make a dollar an hour over there. And then her last hours, those were the last days of her job at Sensata, but her last hours, she spent on her hands and knees literally scraping the tape off of the floor that had been there to be the place marker for where the equipment went. That's what happened to Dot Turner. So, if you go south of there, there's a town called Galesburg, Illinois. And in Galesburg, 13 years ago this month, almost to this day, a plant called Maytag closed. And they sent every one of the 1,500 jobs to Mexico. And here we are a dozen plus years later, and in Knox County, where Galesburg is located, the, the wages still have not recovered in that county from the, the Maytag days. All right, I'm going to give you one more example, and I'm really just sharing this with you because I want you to feel a little bit of the pain that is happening in these smaller towns throughout Illinois. This is a, uh, a plant called Robert Shaw, and it's in a town called Hanover along the Apple River. It's, it's a very beautiful town. If you go from farther south uh, and you're going to Galena, I know if you go to Galena, you're heading west on 20 to get there. But if you go to Galena from the southern part of our state, you pass right through this little town. It's a little curve. And Hanover only has 850 people. And Robert Shaw made these water valves that would regulate the water flow and things like um, uh, dishwashers. And they had a, a near zero defect rate in their work. And the company that ended up buying them out was making very good profits. But they ended up closing that plant also and sending all of those jobs to Mexico. So I, I, I want to just lay that foundation so you understand the kind of congressional district that I serve and just how these towns can be thrown into chaos 
and um, the the hurt that they that they go through. So so this is you'll you'll see some of that um, when when you go through my congressional district still, and. So the people that I talk to and that I meet, and if you came down to my district or if you went to a lot of communities in southern Illinois or in downstate Illinois, you would hear that they're, they're really tired of this kind of story. They're really tired of They're tired of seeing their jobs that are sent overseas. They're, seas. they're tired of training their foreign replacements. They're tired of trading in good jobs for $10 an hour service jobs. And they're, they're, they're also tired of looking into the future and really not seeing any future. And that's a little bit of the moral of the story. And, and while these examples that I gave you went back 13 years, this has really been somewhat of a slow burn recession for the last 30 years. So all of this really has had deep political implications. And I believe that if we don't start getting our policy and our politics right, the Democratic Party will be decimated. I really believe that. I think we have so much work to do. So I want to tell you a little bit then, why, you know, why am I standing up here today? Um, when I was first running, um, I decided from day one that I was going to focus on kitchen table issues. And I had a really tough race ahead of me. You know, it's a swing district. There was a sitting member of, of Congress, a Republican, who I decided to, to run against. And Here's what I decided I was going to do. I'm a former reporter, so I love to talk to people. I love to listen to people. I love to get my hands dirty. I love to know people's stories, because it's my background. And what I found out is that people really appreciate it if you just showed up and you just listened. So I wouldn't just go to chamber events but I would go to places like cattle auction barns where the town might have 500 people. And I wanted to show that I would listen and that I understood and that I was going to fight to improve people's lives. So um, my first race, this is me on my election night, on my first race. So I ended up defeating a sitting member of Congress um, by seven points. And this is my second race. And I ended up winning that race two years later. The guy challenged me, who had been a sitting member of Congress, and I ended up winning that one by 11 points. And then, notice the W, and the, we, we, purposefully, <laughs> we purposefully made sure that we picked that picture, with, with the, in, that in the, the uh, background there. But, um, and I ended up winning last year in 2016 by 20 points. Um, So here's so Donald Trump ends up winning this district, by, but I win by 20 points. And you know, so I've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, just how do you do that? And, um, and, and so and the reason I think there were so many questions is, is this, all right? I'm going to give you so I'm going from the 17th district of Illinois in Illinois to nationally, and this is what's happening. Um, so if you see, those are all like little teeny squares. And those are all of the areas that went for Donald Trump in, in 2016, OK? Um, and then those little squares there are, are counties, county by county, that flipped from President Obama four years earlier to Donald Trump in 2016. And the little blue ones that are ones that flipped the other way. So you see very, very few of the blue, right? Um, and then, for further perspective, where that's circled right there, that is my congressional district. Look, look at in Illinois. It's like all those areas that flipped, or nearly all of them, are right in my congressional district. So we have 14 counties at 7,000 square miles. I won all 14 counties, um, 11 of which are almost entirely rural. And Donald Trump won all of those 11 counties. Um, so we wanted to get that figured out a little bit more. And um, this tells a little bit of a story. And I know it's probably hard to see that in, a little bit in the back. But so this is, this is an employment index that goes back to 2008, OK? Um, this is the economic recovery, right? Pretty good recovery. 
You see that? But if it, that is the blue line is the cities. Okay, so that right. So you feel a, you feel a decent economic recovery, right? This red line down here, those are small towns, and that's rural America. So when I would go around my congressional district, you can see why when the message was, gosh, we just have to build off that success, don't we? I mean, think about that. What, what, we heard it all, you heard it up in Chicago all the time, right? From, on the Democratic side, on the Democratic side. We have to build on that success. Well, this is, this is the result. And if you can't see the numbers, we lost more than, Democrats lost more than 1,000 seats uh, post-President Obama being elected till today. So this is why people <laughs> wanted to know what in the heck are you doing? Um, so we listen to people, we talk to people, and we want, we want to know about what, what's happening, not just in districts like mine, but what, what happened in states like Ohio and Michigan and Iowa and Wisconsin. And my friend Rick Jaskoka, who's here, who owns a company called Jaskoka Terman, it's a, a communications company, strategic communications company, um, went up to Wisconsin and wanted to find out, you know, what exactly do voters think? And what in the heck happened? Why did you vote for President Obama four years earlier and President Trump this time? And if we can play that video, that would be great. It's, it's only two minutes. The Democratic Party always stood for making sure that people were safe and, and secure and had you know, had enough means to get by and everything else, which is great. They just forgot that people here vote and they lost total sight because they thought that they were winning and before the election even started. They figured it was a shoe in That's where they lost it. With what we deal with up in this area, um, I don't think anybody in Wisconsin coming out of Milwaukee or Madison, which is primarily where we see the Democratic Party coming, has a clue what goes on you know, north of Highway 10. I think uh, politicians in general do not understand our concerns or, or anything it showed in their election this year. You know, really it did. It, it just, I, they don't listen to the average common person very well. And they feel excluded up here. Uh, Everything seems to be centered around the big cities. And I know our populations are a lot lower, but they want to be able to be participants, and they don't feel that way. They want people that are going to sit in a room and hash out the problems and make it work. They want somebody that can do it and actually put some common sense to it. I expect the same thing, whether it's a, the town chairman and supervisors in our township or it's the president of the United States. Show me what, tell me what you're gonna do and show me why I can believe that that's what you're actually gonna do. You know, don't tell me what you're gonna do and have a history that says you're gonna do 18 other things. If you got a boat in the water and it has nobody really running this boat, and the boat's just going to turn one way and go in a circle forever and ever and ever. And the pol as far as I can see, the politicians are in this boat. And they're floating around, they're just going in circles. And us, the people, we're all in the water, trying to survive, trying to stay above water. And we can't get in the boat because they never stop us, let us on. And nobody's running the rudder because it just keeps going in the same circle all the time. Come and talk to people, real people. Uh, don't rely all on polls. Polls are fine, but come and actually meet with people. So, I, I mean, I think that guy says it all. Th think about, again, the election and, and where did some of the candidates not go? You know, when I talked about that cattle auction barn in a town of 500 people, I, I meant that. I, I go to those kind of places. So, um, I don't think it's rocket science. And, and I, have a, I have a role out at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee now called, I'm chair of the, the Heartland Engagement. And so I'm talking to candidates all over the country, and we started this new program called Build the Bench where we are encouraging especially younger people and women and people of color to run 
because that is where we are so underrepresented. Um, but I, what, what I do is not really, I don't think it's overly complicated and it's certainly not any rocket science. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share just a couple of those examples. So if anybody wants to run for office, steal these ideas, if you're a Democrat. Um, <laughs> steal, steal, steal these ideas, um, because they work. First of all, it is showing up, it is listening, but we do something nearly every Saturday that we call Supermarket Saturday. And um, so I walk the aisles of grocery stores all over my congressional district. And you know, when I'm in the uh, cornflake aisle, I'm stopping, grandmas and in the tangerine uh, aisle I'm talking to grandpas and in the diaper aisle I'm talking to young moms but I, I only all I do is introduce myself I say I'm gonna be flying back out to Washington DC next week what do you want me to know and it is an open-ended conversation I don't have media with me I typically have one staffer in case we have to open casework and we have a dialogue and what's been interesting is that when I so I've been doing this since I was first elected it used to all be about jobs in the economy I mean, that was always the first thing out of people's mouths. And then starting in, after Donald Trump was elected, it was more about health care. That was the biggest concern. And just in August, during our district work period, the number one thing that people asked me about was, uh, or, or told me to do, was get something done. They are tired of the lack of bipartisanship. They are tired of Democrats and Republicans not working together. They are tired of Trump being bad-mouthed. Um, I tell you, there's not one person at any grocery store that I've gone to, not one, that said impeach Trump, not one who asked me about Russia, not one. They wanted uh, it's jobs, the economy, health care, and get something done. So I do that and I learn a lot. Uh, the other thing that we do is we call it sherry on shift, and all it is is I job shadow people. It's, uh, I've, 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 I'll do my 53rd one of these this week, but um, I have been, a, I'm, I'm now a certified forklift driver. Um, I have processed carp, I have delivered UPS packages, I have been a grocery store clerk, um, I'm, you name it, from mo mostly blue collar jobs, but, but what, what I get out of that is I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with people who are just working hard to support their families. And I like to ask them, were you able to take a vacation last year? What do you do for fun? Because those questions get to people's discretionary income. Um, did you get a raise in the last year? And when you find out some people haven't gotten raises in five years, again, you understand that. So um, we've been doing those for a long time, and it guides us on our legislative agenda. It was through my Sherry on Shifts and through roundtable discussions with, with veterans um, that we have come up with, with some meaningful legislation. Um, this is me signing a bill that looked at um, strategically placing uh, these centers that would help small and mid-sized, especially small and mid-sized manufacturers, find overseas areas where they could sell their goods. Um, we have another bill that came from a, a, our discussion with a group of uh, veterans that uh, we found, when we found out that American flags can be made in China, anybody know that? <laughs> Isn't that like the sickest thing? I mean, I'm sure there are sicker things, but I mean, that, that is, that, that, we just couldn't believe it. So we introduced legislation that said, if you're the federal government, at least if you're the federal government, you gotta buy flags that are made in America. Um, and, and we thought that was a pretty good idea. So, so that came from a, from a um, Vietnam vet who gave us that idea. And um, so that is what has guided us. And, now we're working on something that is called a better deal. And, and let, let me just give you a little bit of background on that. It was uh, uh, just uh, at maybe about a month or so ago that in my role as the, uh, one of the co-chairs of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee, we worked for about a half a year to figure out what do we need to do to be more successful as Democrats? And what do we need to do from a policy perspective what do we need to do from an engagement perspective? And we rolled out this economic agenda. And um, at, when I told you that I'm sitting around that leadership table, this is what um, I've been focused on really for the last half a year of my career in Congress. Um, but what, what the long and short of it is that we focus on jobs in the economy and not the issues that divide us. Um, things like rewarding companies as we look at tax reform 
that actually understand the importance of affordable and accessible child care, who understand that people should uh, make sure that they're, they're, they can retire with, a, with some kind of pension or, or a 401k, and that, um, that people are paid a live, living wage, and that we, we, we reward companies that do that as opposed to having any kind of economic reward for outsourcing jobs. So that has really been our focus. Um, okay, let me find this thing here. So we might not be having, we might not have to talk about that had it not been for this complicated thing. I hate graphs, by the way, because it's not the way my mind works. But I just, I want to share with you what this means. This shows that it used to be up until the 1970s that if you worked hard and you produced a product, that productivity and your wages rose at about the same rate. What this shows is that that doesn't happen anymore. And that if you work hard, um, you are not, and, and you and you produce a product, whatever that may be, um, you are not you, that you are not making the kind of wage that you would have back in the 70s. So wages are not going up with productivity, and that's a problem. So this is why we focused on this. You will not see if you go to any of my events um, in my congressional district. I don't start out by talking about issues that divide us. It doesn't mean that my values are, are different than, than the vast majority of Democrats. It just means that these are the kind of things that, that we focus on. And when we look at this economic agenda, I know we have some people from transportation here, we need to pass a transportation bill. And we need to make it a robust one. Um, I'm on the transportation, transportation committee. I'm on the... Um, Aviation Subcommittee, Highway Subcommittee, Rail Subcommittee, and Water Subcommittee. So I'm, I am in a good place to, to be at ground zero to help negotiate that. But you know, this is high speed rail. We ought to be thinking about things like that. Um, we need to be thinking about making sure that rural broadband um, is part of infrastructure. It's not just roads and bridges, but it is things like rural broadband. We have 23 million Americans in rural areas that don't have access to rural broadband. So that, should, that needs to be part of it. And our downtowns. Um, making sure that, again, that re we are rewarding small and mid-sized companies that cr create two out of every three of our new jobs. So um, in closing, um, this is just me stopping by and talking to people. Um, I just think there's a heck of a lot more that unites us than divides us. Um, it, it's probably partly because I come from a very bipartisan region of the state of Illinois. But it's also because I've worked in the private sector all of my life until uh, this job where I'm now making a living um, in the federal government. But th we, we truly need to think about what our own role is in making sure that um, we do our part to encourage bipartisanship, um, encourage uh, working together for the good of our country. And um, I, feel, I feel very blessed um, in how I was raised because, um, I, you know, I figured that I, I had some level of success before I was elected. Um, and I think that whatever I do in my future, um, I'll have some level of success. So I don't fear um, every single vote and if somebody's going to be upset with me about that. Rather, my North Star is really making sure that we're doing right by the state of Illinois and that we're doing right by our country. So I want to um, say thank you. And um, with that, um, Ed, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And uh, we have time for a few questions. So if anybody has any questions, um, just our staff, Amanda. Thank you. Amanda, who used to work with my cousin. So there's another connection. So I liked Amanda as soon as I walked in. And <laughs> Amanda is the new Acting Executive Director of the City Club of Chicago. Okay, so let's give her a big round of applause. Okay. Terrific. The first question from Kirk Dillard and Don Orsino. This is not about... It might have something to do with transportation. Yeah, I don't think this is much about which corn seed are they using. Okay. You care about that, too. Absolutely. Funks hybrids, right, Kirk? Okay. When will we see President Trump's trillion dollars for infrastructure? Ooh. 
Well, when Donald called me recently, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, I, I actually am going to say I'm optimistic that we're, we're going to be getting, be able to get something done, okay? Now, keep in mind, I'm like one of the least senior member of the Transportation Committee, but I'm just saying that because it, it's a committee, both, both ag and tr the Transportation Committees that I serve on, I think we work really well together. We've got uh, our Republican chairman out of the state of Pennsylvania is a good guy. We're held up right now over a desire uh, for the chairman to privatize the air traffic controllers, something that I cannot get on board with, um, and that mo most people, I don't think, there's, there's enough Republicans and Democrats that are opposing that, that that's a hang up right now. But we, we not only need a trillion dollar, dollar transportation package, we need actually a two trillion plus dollar transportation package. We really do. Oh, that gets us to a B grade. Um, and, and that's, that's a $2.4 trillion investment. We've got ways to fund it. That, that's obviously part of the uh, differences, but um, it is something that's desperately needed. And, and believe me, as a downstater who travels to Chicago every time we come here and hit the traffic, um, it, it is something. And I know for those of you who live um, with that, uh, want that as well. And for every dollar we invest in infrastructure, we get a $2 return. So it, it is truly a great investment in our future. Um, the timing on it, though, is a little bit up in the air. The next order of business is the, uh, is the tax reform. Um, so we'll see how that goes, <laughs> too. <laughs> thanks, Kirk. Okay, thanks, Kirk, and thank you, Don. Oh, and thanks, Don, too. This is um, from Dave Saunders at uh, Jenner and Block. The question is, what common legislative ground is there between Democrats and Republicans in the Trump administration? What do you think we can get done? We actually had two encouraging weeks uh, in, in Washington, which is very unusual. And, and it probably depends on what perspective you come from, but I happen to think it was a good um, move when President Obama, or, I'm sorry, President Trump invited Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer over to the White House and had a sit down meeting. And they walked out of that and said that they can work together on the uh, deferred action against uh, uh, child uh, rivals, the DACA. Um, and that while it would include border security, um, it wouldn't necessarily be the wall. I think that was encouraging. And then the week before, also agreeing to that, that extension, um, you know, those, those were good signs. And I, I think if um, we could keep the Twitter account away from the president, we'd be a lot better off um, because there, it, it really does create a problem, I, I think, for, for our stature in the world when he's calling the North Korean leader rocket man and just, you know, some of the very odd things that come out of that. But um, so I'm, you know, hopefully on DACA, we'll, we'll be able to come together. J just a really quick story on that. I went to Henderson County, which is a very rural county in my district. So it's the farthest southwestern county in my district along the Mississippi River. It is only 1.4% of the votes that are in my congressional district, so very small. And I go down there to a fish fry last Sunday and I had an older gentleman um, who came up to me and he said, look out for those kids, will ya? And I did not expect that in Henderson County from an older guy. And you know, that, that kind of thing gi gives me hope that um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get something together. Other than that, I'm gonna stick with transportation that we should be able to work together on. Um, I hope that we can make some meaningful tax reform that, that uh, benefits uh, small, small and mid-sized businesses. Um, for, as, as, a, as a Democrat, I, I want to be viewed as a, somebody who values business. Um, and I value organized labor too, so um, I, I am, you know, to my core, I want to make sure that, that people can earn a decent living and all of that. But I also honor and, and have a great appreciation for, for businesses as well. And I think as Democrats, we need to embrace that more. Thank you, Congresswoman. We have two questions here related to uh, health care. One from Dave Lundy, a City Club member. What is the status of bipartisan cooperation on fixing the um, Affordable Care Act? And the other, a little more pointed question from uh, Patricia Canessa with the Illinois Public Health Association. Her question is, health care access continues to be a major challenge for immigrants. Undocumented women can obtain a free mammogram in our state, 
but if they receive a cancer diagnosis, there's no resources available. What can we do to address this gap? Ooh, those are hard. Um, so I, I didn't include in my bio that after I was a journalist, I actually worked in healthcare for 10 years. And um, so in, in that timing that I worked in healthcare, it was before, during, and after the Affordable Care Act was passed. And it was very, any, do we have healthcare, any healthcare workers here? So for, for those of you in healthcare, you know this very well. We were on a totally unsustainable path before the Affordable Care Act passed it. Our, what people's costs were, were going up by double digit rates. Um, so the Affordable Care Act helped address that. However, um, it is, it's flawed. You know, it's a huge piece of legislation and it's flawed. I think if we address two areas where I'm hoping that we can come together, uh, that is the cost of prescription drugs. It is, um, it's hurting way too many families. I have so many physicians who will tell me that they'll prescribe medication and people will either not fill it at all because they can't afford it or they will take half the dosage to spread that out. Um, and you know, that's, that's, that's a terrible situation to, uh, to be in if that's, if, if that's what's happening. And then number two, our, our premiums, our co-pays and our deductibles are, are, are too high for way too many people. So I think those are the two areas where we, sh we ought to be able to come together because you know, that, the result of that is not um, specific to whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Um, however, there was just so much rhetoric on the campaign trail for so long about this repeal and replace that I think that's what ended up happening. The, the bill that passed the House is a terrible bill that will knock, would knock more than 20 million Americans off their health insurance. In my district alone, that would have been 60,000, uh, I'm sorry, 45,000 people would have lost their health insurance. In Illinois, we'd lose 60,000 jobs as a result of that. Um, and, and so, it, I mean, just a terrible piece of legislation. Um, but there has, there's going to have to be a real desire uh, for the leadership to, to be able to sit down and, and work that through. And, and right now, that's been a holdup. Um, as far, I don't know if I have a great answer for um, the, the person who can get a mammogram but did not get care, um, other than that, you know, hospitals, there's, there's a lot of charity care. Um, for those who work in health care, know what that means, basically where care is given away and written off as, as a service to the community. Um, and so I think if you're an advocate for people who fall in that situation, I think it's looking into how a charity care case can be, can be opened. And I know that's not a long-term solution, but it, that would be a much longer and more complicated conversation that we, than we have time for right now. Okay, we have time for about two more questions. Okay. Uh, this is from Jamie Redman with the Redman Construction Corporation. How will you communicate the need for policies like paid parental leave and childcare support that will protect working families especially working moms from financial hardship and lost earnings career opportunities. So was that question in context with the Better Deal economic agenda? Whoever asked that? I think so. You, you, okay, so how will we, it, it is included as part of that. Um, we are actually rolling out Plank's uh, hardcore policy over the, um, I'm gonna be making an announcement next week on a, a rural broadband initiative that, we're, that we have legislation for. Um, we have legislation that was just rolled out last week on child care. So that is part of the economic agenda, and you will, see, you will be seeing those, uh, the details of that in the coming months. But if you want to see what we rolled out on the child care, go to um, Google a better deal. I don't know what the website is, but if you do a better deal, there, that legislation is on there. And, and back to the Patriot companies that we should reward, through uh, tax incentive, what you just asked about. Who, can you raise your hand, whoever asked that? Uh, it came in over oh. our uh, internet. Okay, so, hi there. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, so hopefully that, that gives you a little more, more information about that, but it is part of our economic agenda. Okay, thank you. Great, so you see, you don't even have to be here in person sometimes <laughs> to get a question asked. Technology. Yeah, technology. Two questions, they sort of are, are interrelated, our final question here. Uh, John O'Neill with Mike Baker International. How do you see the outlook for federal infrastructure funding? And then Bob Johnson, who's with Trains Magazine, which is a great magazine, by the way. But Bob, you're not a member of the City Club. I will not oh. renew my subscription, Bob, unless you become a member. 
This is called quid pro quo. It's how we get things done. So are you going to read his question still? Sure. Absolutely. With your permission. Uh, do you support increasing capital and operating investment in nationwide rail travel as opposed to just regional and intercity? So passenger rail. Sure. Okay, so can I see that for just a second, please? Absolutely. Okay, so the first one was another infrastructure question. You guys are like really into infrastructure. Yeah, tough question. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, yeah, so my answer on infrastructure, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the outlook is kind of what I said. There, there are various funding packages that are out there for, um, that can get us to a trillion dollars. Um, there are almost two and a half trillion dollars of corporate profits that are sitting overseas. One of the proposals is to bring that back, put in an infrastructure bank bond on that. That gives us about six years worth of robust funding. That has bipartisan support. Um, but, but I can't tell you how many different um, needs there are to tap into that. So infrastructure would just be one. There are also uh, there are proposals that look at our Harbor Trust Fund and making sure that that money actually stays there as opposed to being uh, used in our general fund. There are, uh, uh, this might be somewhat controversial, but uh, the passenger facility charge at airports, depending on if you're at the airport or an airline uh, where you come down on that one, that's another one. Mm -hmm. Gas tax is, uh, there's uh, many people who say we haven't passed this in more than uh, two decades and it's uh, past due to uh, take a look at that as part of our funding package as well. So there are a lot of different proposals that are out there. It, it's a matter of the, where's the political will to pass that. But as I said before, we need a robust um, funding package on that. On passenger rail, um, this was actually uh, something I've been involved with very closely because we got $177 million in federal funding um, in our community for a passenger rail route from Chicago to Moline, oops, sorry, to Moline, Illinois. And, um, and what happened was um, there was a delay when there was the new governor's administration in Illinois. And um, we kind of had to go head to head on making sure that the governor accepted that $177 million. And in the end, he did. And um, so that got a little behind schedule, but uh, that will happen. And so I think it's a great thing for Chicago, and I think it's a great thing for our area to have that. But my personal view on passenger rail, you saw the, the, the maglev train picture that I had up there. I mean, I think, I think we should not only be shooting for passenger rail, like um, in Illinois, the, the faster train, but high speed transfer, uh, train travel, passenger rail travel. Um, our, we have, in the global economy, we are being way outdone in that area. And, um, you know, there has to be an appetite to pay for that. And that's, you know, that's always the hang up. But, but am I a pro proponent of it? Yes, I am. And um, so whoever asked that question, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more afterwards. Okay, thank Great. you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Congresswoman Bustos.